So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jeff Dirk. I'm the provost and executive vice president here at the University of Miami. And I'd just like to welcome everyone to the event this afternoon. It's really an honor for me to welcome all of you to the annual Smart Cities Miami Conference. And as most of you know, this is co-hosted by our Institute for Data Science and Computing, the School of Architecture, and also in partnership with our newly established Climate Resilience Academy. As everyone appreciates in this room, our natural and built environments continuously face evolving threats, whether it be hurricanes in the summer or fall, or even just torrential rain as we're seeing today. We live in a region where the impacts and threats from climate change are especially acute. Our local governments have collaboratively designed Resilient 305 strategy to tackle these and other emerging challenges. And we at the University of Miami serve as a living lab, building capacity and intellectual power to address these local and global challenges to build a much more resilient environment. Our new, our new Climate Resilience Academy is just one example of that. The Climate Resilience Academy is a functional unit that supports our schools and colleges and university in interdisciplinary, problems-driven research and education to train not only the next generation of scientists, but more importantly, I think, and particularly relevant to this conference, is to deliver solutions to climate change impacts and other environmental stressors. The University of Miami, we are committed to working in close partnership with you our friends, our industry partners, government, other universities, and other stakeholders. And to me, this is a particularly exciting time to convene all of you as leaders and to come together from sectors to closely examine innovation in the smart cities field and to think about how that can help flourish Miami's tech culture. Today's conference provides the university and our surrounding community an opportunity to have an open dialogue about climate resilience in smart cities, the theme for today's event, and to look closely at ways the public policy can promote growth as well as resilience. Those don't have to compete. At the University of Miami, we take great pride in our diverse research endeavors and our commitment to interdisciplinary research. This event is a reflection of that. So we continue to strengthen our commitment to partnership with regional and local academic, governmental, and community groups to address these important issues. So thanks to all of you for making this event happen. Thank you for being interested in the topic and committed to development in the future. And it's really my pleasure to, to thank all of you to help expand our collective efforts in this very important field. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dean Rudy El Khoury, the Dean of our School of Architecture, as well as the, one of our interim directors of the Climate Resilience Academy. Rudy? Oh. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very delighted and honored to welcome you to the 2023 Smart Cities Miami Conference as uh, Professor Dirk mentioned, it's jointly hosted by IDISC, the School of Architecture, and for the first time this year in partnership with the Climate Resilience Academy. The, the Academy is going to become the hub of climate-related uh, activities and research, and we're very excited ab about partnering with this functional unit, a new functional unit at the university. So hence the theme of our conference this year, climate resilience. So what are the, how does smart city uh, infrastructure facilitate climate adaptation? What are the promising technology in the climate solution space? What are the challenges with regard to cybersecurity when we are talking about climate resilience and climate solutions uh, driven by technology? What are the ethical and legal consequences of these solutions? These and many other questions will be uh, on the table with our three panels this afternoon. It's going to be very interesting, so please stick with us to the end of the day. The conference 
I have to say, isn't strictly academic. I mean, in the, in the strict sense of what we think of an academic conference, Smart Cities Miami, as indicated by the title, is about smart city, the smart city phenomenon in Miami, our city, in real world application, and in partnership with local government and industry. This is a forum for our larger community, entrepreneurs, innovators that are uh, reinventing Miami as the incubator for tech startups, the development and planning agencies in the public and private sectors that are guiding the evolution of one of the fastest growing cities in North America. We are invested in this public forum because we really believe that we are at the threshold of major transformations in the built environment provoked by new services and practices driven by emerging technology. So we kick off the conference with uh, my esteemed colleague, Ben Kurtman, a leading scientist at the forefront of studies on the predictability and variability of climate systems with the big picture on climate uh, change. And we conclude uh, the formal program today with Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, who will anchor the discussion in South Florida with its challenges and opportunities. After the mayor talk, mayor's talk, we invite you to join the reception and the network, networking uh, session, but also invite you and remind you again to check out the exhibits, which are, will be here on display all day. Tomorrow we move to the, the pavilion, across here, the courtyard, uh, and it's a program built in collaboration with our presenting sponsor, Double C. This is a leading construction company from Colombia that has recently established a base in South Florida and is now supporting research on building technology at the School of Architecture. I would like to thank Double C and especially Alejandra Pardo de Francisco. Alejandra, thank you for their generosity and vision in supporting the conference and the research. I would also like to acknowledge Evelyn Cruz, Helen Janelle, Justin Gamage, and Mike, uh, Mitchell uh, Latzman, and the rest of the team for putting all this together flawlessly. Thank you for the great work. And now I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Ben Kurtman. Ben is known worldwide for bringing unprecedented detail to climate change measurement. He holds the William R. Middleton Endowed Chair of Earth Science at the Rosenthal School and directs NOAA's Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Science Studies. This is a federally funded center of excellence on the marine campus, UM's marine campus. Also, he, he serves as deputy director for IDISC and leads its Earth System Science program. In 2018, Ben was elected as fellow in the American Meteorological Society in recognition for his outstanding contributions to the field. Please join me in welcoming Ben Kurtman. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, thank you for um, the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you to the organizers, Jeff. Thank you, and uh, the sponsors. Um, I'm going to point out uh, two of my multitude of character flaws. Uh, it's important to be honest about. One, I'm a traditional academic in the sense you give me a microphone, it's very dangerous. I can talk forever. So whoever's keeping time, be sure and tell me to pull the plug. Tell me when it's time to stop. The uh, other character flaw is I can't stand still for the life of me. So you're just going to have to put up with me moving around and pacing. And I apologize for that. And my family can tell you what a tremendous character flaw it is. It's really frustrating when you're trying to watch UM in the Elite Eight and I'm pacing in front of the TV. <clears throat> All right. So let's get started. You have to point it to the computer, not to the screen. 
important lesson. Oh, that's me. There we go. So I want to talk about uh, climate uh, smart cities and start to think about uh, how do we provide hyper-local information. And the reason I want to start there is the climate change problem from my perspective, I'm sure some of my colleagues might disagree with me, but I think the global climate change problem is solved. We know the climate is changing and we know why. Right? So that, that problem is solved. The question now is, we've committed to another 40, maybe 50 years of warming. The question is, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to adapt to those challenges? How are we going to take advantage of some opportunities that may be associated with that? And so I put on the title here, actionable information. And because that's what I get asked for all the time. And I don't think that's what people really want. What they really want is actionable science. What do I mean by, what's the distinction there? What I think they want is if they're gonna believe in the information that we're providing, they wanna make sure we understand the science that underpins it. They wanna make sure, they wanna be able to trust that information. If they're gonna act on that information, they wanna know we believe it. If I give you a forecast that it was gonna be sunny today, I should have been circumspect. You wouldn't trust it, right? And so the same thing is true with a climate projection or a climate forecast. If I can't tell you why it is what it is, you're not going to trust it. So people who have to make decisions based on lots of money want to know, can they trust it? And that's what I mean by actionable science as opposed to actionable information. We understand what's going on. Okay. So uh, as Rudy mentioned, I'm going to give you a big picture uh, of global climate change, where the state of the science is now, what we think we know. Uh, we know quite a bit. Uh, there was an IPCC report just released a few days ago. Uh, so I'm going to give you a bit of a summary of that most recent report. And then I want to talk about uh, where I think the climate change community, uh, guys like me, are not doing enough. Where we really need to switch gears and start to think about what are the implications for where you're sitting right now. How do we produce climate information for where you sit and so that you can make a decision about what you're going to do in the next 5, 10, 15 years, or even the next two weeks, months, or seasons. So in order to be able to do that, we think we know what needs to be done. We need to identify what's happening in the large-scale climate system that determines what's happening locally. And so I'm going to show you some examples of that. And that sounds very technical and very scientific, and it is. But there's a really important element to it. And that is that the people that are making the decision on this information have to be involved in the development of the science. And that's very different. That's something new. And we're not good at that yet. And that's something that I'm hoping the Climate Resilience Academy will help us become very good at. Uh, so the demand of the, my point here is that the demand of the information is going to drive how we do the science. And that seems, seems really weird. Well, but if you think about it, suppose, you know, suppose you're a, a, a short-term climate forecaster and you're worried about, uh, uh, you know, forecasting cold temperatures. And you're a farmer who's do, growing citrus. He needs to know how hard is the freeze? How long is it going to last? Well, typically a climate forecaster doesn't think about those things. He just says the temperature is what it is. So if you think about the duration of the freeze, how hard the freeze is, you're going to do your science differently. So how the information is going to be used has to drive how you do it. That means it has to be very customized and very integrated into decision support systems. And that's something we just haven't done yet. There's a lot to be done there. The other thing I want to point out throughout this talk is if you think about you know, this opportunity to have hyper-local information to make decisions as a, in your everyday life at your fingertips. That's a smart city kind of thing. If I'm going to think about trying to produce that, I want data to verify what I've done, what I've predicted. I need data to feed back, to validate, to improve our tools. So there's this partnership between providing the information and getting information back. Flood is the great example. We don't have flood measurements except at uh, tide gauge stations. 
There is no network to measure flood. Is it flooding somewhere on campus? Is there six inches of water somewhere on campus? We have no idea. We have no measurements for that whatsoever. So to provide that kind of hyperlocal information, we need citizen scientists, smart cities, to give us that information back so we can validate our tools and develop our tools. So there's a great partnership here to be had. So this is sort of um, summarizing all those thoughts that I put together at the beginning. You can sort of think as, you know, if you go up the quad here, if you're just going up to the upper part of the quad, that's a very climate-centric approach. That's what we've been doing as climate scientists for years. We run our climate models, we hypothesize, we put in various scenarios for what we think the future is going to look like, and we look at the impacts in, independent of how that information is used, completely independent of how that information is used. Now we're starting to think, okay, we need to start customizing things based on how people are going to use that information. That's good, but that's not the whole battle. That's not the whole battle, so the customization is important, but it also needs to be holistic. You need to think about all of the decision, things that go into that, in the, to those decision processes that the person has to make. And that has to be a very integrated approach. And so to really be successful in this hyper-local space that I think is relevant for smart cities, we need to be in this bottom quadrant. And we're, we're not there yet. There's a lot of great work to be done. So, I have a job for a while, I think. Okay, so just going through these points, uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the most recent IPCC uh, report. The summary for policymakers just came out a couple of weeks ago. It has some nice, nice results and some nice graphics on it. One thing to think about, uh, the first one here, is the concentrations of carbon dioxide. This is looking uh, at the, at the, um, in, the, in the top panel here uh, the, the concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, for the entire Earth history that we have some proxy data all the way into the future out to 2300. And so there's, it's pretty hard to look at those plots, but I want to I want to make it a little bit easier for you. I want to go back just 800,000 years. And this this is a um, a, a figure, uh, some data that profoundly affected me when I think when I was thinking about climate. This is going back 800,000 years. It's showing you the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and the temperature concentrations in the atmosphere. And if you think about the CO2 over the last 800,000 years, it's gone from, say, uh, something like 200 parts per million by volume to 300 parts per million by volume. Two to three. It takes about 30, uh, 10 to 30,000 years to transition between 200 to 300 or 300 to 200. 10,000 years or so, plus or minus. Right? And you can see these oscillations. That's orbital changes in the climate, in the uh, planetary system, orbital changes, right? And you can see the temperature goes right along with it. And I put on the chart there where we are today, actually uh, this morning or yesterday morning, 418. We went from approximately 300 parts per million by, by volume in 1850 to 418 in less than 200 years in less than 200 years. It normally takes, it normally takes 10,000 years to change by 1,000 parts, uh, 100 parts per million by volume. And we did it in just a little over, two, a little less than 200 years. So you can't say that we're not uh, changing the climate system, at least the CO2 concentrations in the climate system, that that's not due to human activities. It's settled science. I don't think there's any debate there. And we would expect the temperature to go along with those changes in CO2. So we are out of bounds by 100 parts per million by volume, by over 100 parts per million by volume, than we have ever been in the last 800,000 years. OK, glaciers. If you give a climate change talk, I think it's, there's a law that requires you to show a picture of glaciers. I think that's, that's the law. Glaciers, glaciers, ice on land is, uh, uh, the canary in the coal mine from my perspective, right? These are slow moving systems. These are slow moving systems. And I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute, uh, in just a second, that shows you that 98% of the glaciers on the planet Earth are retreating, okay? Now, if, if everything was cool, no pun intended, if everything was cool and the climate system was in equilibrium, the glaciers that were retreating would be balanced by the glaciers that are growing. So half would be growing and half would be retreating. 
the net would be about the same amount of ice, everything would be cool. That's what we would expect if the climate system was in equilibrium. This is the, a, an interesting plot. It's the leading edge. It's the leading edge. It's the front of all the glaciers around planet Earth. All of them. It's the front. And we centered things on, on 1960. So it's the front position is zero in 1960. So going back in time, as you go back in time, you can see the front was further forward, right? Forward moving front. And then if you go out to 2020, that front, that ice sheet front, right? of almost 98% of the glaciers around the world, 98% of them, right, it's retreating. 98% of the glaciers are retreating. The climate system is not in equilibrium. It's not in balance. Uh, temperature, of course, we would expect temperature. Uh, this is a temperature record. This is a temperature record, do I have a pointer? Oh, look, I even have a pointer. That this is a temperature record going, you know, going back maybe say 10,000 years. This is, uh, I like to look at these historical databases in this uh, industrialization period. You can see, a, 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 you know, a, a very clear rise in temperatures. Everybody's seen this 100 times. The most recent decade here, the most recent decade is the warmest decade on record for the last 125,000 years. Amazing, just amazing stuff. Whoops. Sea level rise. So you, I'm sure you've all know, during you know, the glass glacial minimum, much of where we're sitting was underwater. It's no surprise, all that ice on land melted. If, uh, if all of Greenland, let's just take Greenland, if all of Greenland melted, suppose all of Greenland melted today, that would be 27 feet 27 feet of water everywhere, everywhere. So there'd be a sea level rise of 27 feet. We would be, you know, floating up there. It would be tremendous. So if we look back, one of the things that's often come up is, is, the, is what's going on with sea level, because there's these huge changes over the historical record, is it stable? And this bottom plot here, uh, the top plot here, is showing you estimates of sea level because it's a little bit tricky when you go back 3,000 years. Estimates of sea level from uh, core samples and uh, coral reef samples and things like that, drilling samples. Estimates of sea level over the last 3,000 years, and it was pretty stable. Pretty stable. Pretty stable. And then the Industrial Revolution came on, came on in the early 1900s, and then sea level has risen significantly. Uh, this is looking over the satellite record. There's a reason to trust the satellite record a little bit more than the, those historical records. The data is a little bit better. And so you can see this is uh, global mean sea level rising since the uh, early 1990s all the way to uh, basically 2020 here. The um, uh, blue curve here, that's the freshwater input from those glaciers that are melting and from Greenland. And uh, most recently, even Antarctica is starting to contribute. In the mid-2000s, mid you know, we had this debate in the climate community whether Antarctica was actually contributing or was it, was it growing or shrinking. It started to shrink in the mid-2000s and has continued to shrink. So you can see a significant component is just ice melting on land and flowing into the ocean. And then, of course, this part is just the you know, and you know this from your own experience, if you heat up a gas, it takes up more space. Same thing happens in the ocean. You heat up the ocean, it takes up more space. Another, another one that I sort of view as the, is the canary in the coal mine, and, and one we have to really be worried about, is ice in the ocean in uh, the North Pole, Arctic sea ice. So, uh, why am I so worried about Arctic sea ice? It's already in the ocean. It's not going to change sea level. But if you're, Ar the sea ice in the Arctic is very, very old. Very old. Centuries old, a lot of that ice. And so if you're constantly losing centuries, centuries old ice, it's going to take centuries to come back. So it's, it's turning into a tipping point. And 
The other thing about the sea ice in the Arctic is it reflects a lot of sunlight. So as that ice melts, it's no longer reflecting the sunlight. The sunlight penetrates into the ocean and warms the ocean, which then contributes to the melting of the ice, which then allows more sunlight to penetrate. Positive feedback, the climate systems starting to get, get away from us. And what you can see in this plot right here, this is showing uh, here's 2020, 2019, and a couple more recent years. 2012 was quite, quite the whopper of a year in terms of sea ice loss. So this is how many square kilometers we had of sea ice. So the gray curves here are what happens normally. Right? That's sort of what, what we consider climatology. This is what's been happening over the last decade or so. This is what's happening over the last decade or so. We're getting close to the point where we're going to have what we call an ice-free Arctic, uh, maybe 2040, something like that, a summer where the ice is, there's an ice-free Arctic. Just imagine uh, the shenanigans that's going to happen when the Arctic becomes ice-free, the navigation, the, the exploration, the conflicts, it's, it's going to be magical. Okay, so how do we go forward into the future? How do we go forward into the future? And this, from, as a climate scientist, this really, uh, I find this unsettling. I find this very unsettling. Um, uh, these are uh, projections of how much CO2 is going to be in the atmosphere going forward into the future. So the black part here, this is the observed CO2 uh, up, in, up until 2015. And then uh, the green curve and these other colored curves are showing you uh, projections of what, what economists speculate CO2 might look like into the future. Uh, no offense to economists, but the, it's, it's their assumptions about GDP around the world. It's how they think about how economies in other continents are going to grow or not grow. It's not a climate assumption. It's an assumption about GDP because there's this intense link between GDP and CO2 emissions. We know this ourselves here in the US. When the GDP goes up, CO2 emissions go up. And it happens worldwide. So these are assumptions about what the future would look like. This green curve, the green one here, which looks the less, least threatening, that's the CO2 emissions that we need to get close to stabilizing the climate system with only a degree and a half or, or so more warming. Okay. The, the part that's unsettling for me is climate scientists like myself, we put them into our climate models as if they're predictions of the future. That's not what the economists are doing. They're going, these are what if experiments. What if this happened? What if that has happened? That disconnect is important if you're trying to make a decision based on climate model output. You're treating it as a forecast of the future, but it's part of a what-if experiment. And we've done a very poor job of explaining that to the people that are using these climate models to make decisions. Um, so based on, those, based on those scenarios of what the future would look like, this is our projections. See, I, even I fall into the trap. These are really... Uh, guesses of how the climate system might respond to uh, continued increases in CO2 as business as usual up here in the, in the red and the pink. The uh, gray and the, and the blue down here is um, this best case scenario that we can uh, mitigate and reverse some of the CO2 emissions. I have to point out, I have to point out, we, you know, this uh, curve sort of stops in uh, uh, 2015, these curves start. Um, We've already busted. We're well above the blue curve. We're not, we're not going to make it. We are already uh, have emissions that are too high. Uh, global mean sea level rise that goes along with that. Uh, of course, global mean sea level rise is very interesting, but if you live in Florida, you don't care. What the, what, yes, global mean sea level rise is very threatening. What does it mean to me if I have a, uh, you know, if you're Provost Dirk and you're worried about a marine campus on Virginia Key and he's got a plan for the next 30 years, how many times is it going to flood on Virginia Key? He needs to know that hyperlocal information. The climate science, you know, the IPCC report that our people are using to extrapolate to what we're not doing, you know, what's going on in Virginia Key, we're not doing a good job there. 
we need to switch gears and start really thinking about what are the hyperlocal implications of some of this stuff. Uh, okay, so I'm arguing that we need to become more, uh, we need to do the science to be more hyperlocal. I want to talk about how we do that. We, we have some ideas. We can do this. We need to start building those partnerships to get it done. So uh, again, this is the failure. Uh, this is from the, uh, the old models. This is the, uh, the IPCC report that I was a coordinating leader, lead author on, this, these older ones. And you can see our models have gotten to higher resolution. So we're, we're using computer models to resolve what's happening in space and time. And the computer models have gotten more sophisticated and they have smaller spacing. So we're much higher resolution, okay? But if you're, if you're in Florida and in, in Miami and you need to make a decision about temperature, you, you're hard pressed to see that there's any, any new innovation between these two plots, even though this one, you know, Looks, looks sketchy because it's got these boxes. This one looks less, less sketchy, but if you zoom in, it's, it's got the boxes. So we're not doing enough. And then, you know, uh, whoops, oh, one of my slides is missing. Um, that's okay. Uh, this is the same thing for rainfall. It's even worse. See all that stuff that's hatched, that's hatching? That means we can't even make it, we can't provide any information. Our models don't agree. We can't even provide information. Huge regions where there's all that hatching. You know, if you wanted to think about the dry season, this is rainfall, uh, this is in the dry season uh, over Florida, it's mostly hatched. There's a hint that there might be a slight increase of rainfall in the dry season and a hint that there might be a decrease in rainfall in the wet season, but it's hatched. So you can't say anything. We try to do a little bit better. This is some work we do at, at, the, at the Rosensteel School using higher resolutions, but it's still not enough. The reason it's not enough is we're not, we're, we're starting from the global perspective and trying to just increase the resolution, increase the resolution, make it right. And I think we need to actually start from the scale that the decision needs to be made. Start at the grid point and ask, can we do that? Can we do that? And that's this, this point that I raised earlier. And so this is an example of, yes, I think we can do that. Okay. So uh, I had a, a friend uh, that I grew up with that's in um, fire risk management in Santa Barbara, California, where I grew up. And um, he's uh, very worried about extreme winds in a changing climate very worried about extreme winds and the changing climate. And so what I did is, uh, let's, let's see if we can make a, make a statement about how extreme winds are, are changing in Santa Barbara, California, where I grew up. So this is, this is relevant at my dad's house. He still lives there. It's relevant at my dad's house. And so this plot right here, it's hard to see, but right here, there's a big maximum. It hits one. So the risk of extreme winds is increasing a lot here, big risk. And that's based on the truth, what's happened over the historical record since the 1980s to the present, right? And then this picture is showing you the large scale signal, how the climate system goes with that risk. And you see it's very spatially coherent, big signal. As soon as I see that as a climate modeler, I think I can actually predict that risk. And so then this has taken my model using the same observations, the same extreme winds in Santa Barbara and doing the same calculation. So it's not perfect, but it's a large scale pattern. So if when I show this to my fire risk buddy, he's like, oh, okay, I can trust this. You understand this. You've made a, you understand how this works. I can use this information when you make a prediction of how fire risk is gonna change into the future. And my argument is, I did two things. I worked with someone that has to make a decision and almost fell off. Um, I worked with someone who has to make a decision, this fire risk manager, and I did it from the hyperlocal scale looking outward to what are the large scale climate drivers. The IPCC process, the usual stuff that climate change scientists are doing, and I'm guilty of this as much as everybody else, is we're looking globally and trying to find things locally. And I think the right way to do this is to start locally take the information, how that information is going to be used and build it out 
globally, make sure I can, I can understand it. I can build trust if, I, if my tools do a reasonable job. Same kinds of things with uh, 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 flood. So uh, uh, this is looking, I, liked, I really like this calculation. This is some work I did with one of my graduate students that just graduated. Um, we were really interested in, we got the Miami Herald called us uh, up and they uh, asked us what, you know, what are, we, what are you doing about local floods? And I said, I, I explained to the editor, the problem that we should be solving is, is should be driven by what people worry about. And so he said, well, what do people worry about? And so when I give climate change talks and I, I talk to people afterwards, uh, the way I sort of convey this is, is when there's a 70% chance that there's going to be 70 days with seven inches of water in front of your house for seven hours, that's going to be a problem. Right? And that, they agree. That's, yes, that's, that's, that's when I got to deal with that. And I chose the sevens because I can remember that. So it could be six, could be five, could be nine, whatever. But I can remember the seven. So 70% chance, 70 days a year, seven inches of water for at least seven hours. And so then you can start, you can start thinking about when you, when you have those, how many of those flood days. These are only one hour and six hour because it's a graduate student and she doesn't, she just decided to do something else, not what I told her to do, but that's fine. Uh, but you can see how uh, there's a clear trend in the number of days of flooding for one hour and a clear trend in the number of days for six hours. And then these are hyperlocal projections of what that flood would look like going forward. These are entirely driven by localized data, localized data. So again, global sea level contributes to this because we have to use that to figure out how these curves are part of how these curves are going to evolve. But the regional, the specifics for Virginia Key are driven by the localized data. And then, of course, this is doing this all over Miami-Dade County. Uh, again, one hour versus six hours, 70% chance of flooding. And what's nice about this plot that, that Mary Beth made is it notes the year that you cross that threshold of 70% chance, the year that you cross that threshold. So for some places, we've already crossed it. We've already crossed that threshold. So the last, the last little bit that I want to mention is the data collection part. And I, I think this is, a, from my perspective as a climate scientist who's really trying to think about how do we do the hyperlocal problem, uh, this is really the exciting stuff. So, you know, the, the charge to me is to work with people who are making the decision to figure out, to figure out how do we build the trust uh, in terms of what the science is telling us so that they're willing to make a decision based on that. So that's what we have to do. I have to work together with people who have to make decisions, build that trust. At the same time, I want data. I want this hyperlocal data so I can make, I can confront my models, confront my tools with what really happened. And so this is a big part of the partnership. So smart cities is an opportunity to collect that hyperlocal data of extreme heat, of flooding in the streets, so that I can confront my models with, with that information. And so this is where I think that, that partnership is really going to intellectually benefits what I want to do. Um, so this is just, I've already said it, hammering that, that uh, point home. So last slide, um, this is what I think uh, the future is, obviously. I think I've said it 10 times over. Uh, there's going to be revolutions, machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science. That's part of the reason why the Institute for Data Science and Computing sponsors this event. That's, that revolution in data is going to be critical for smart cities, but it's also going to be, uh, data science is going to be critical for the work I do. Uh, computational resources are a big part of that. Additional data sets are a big part of that. We think we can make better models, better predictions, do better science, more trustworthy science, so people can, can make decisions based on that science, actionable science. And that, that process to make actionable science means I have to interact with the person that's making the decision. Highly customized and integrated with all of the decision processes that they have to, they have to engage with. And they, they may cut across time. They may be interested in what's happening you know, over the next five years as opposed to what's happening at the mid-century. We have to be willing to bite that off. And then, of course, 
this notion of, of using our partnerships with the people that have to make decisions to collect data. I, you know, citizen scientists that then you are used to confront our models and make better, better science. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, sure. Questions? It was all 100% clear, so you have no concerns whatsoever? Oh, uh, it's a fabulous question. It's probably a four-hour conversation to answer it. Um, uh, the interoperability, I want to drill down on the interoperability part because I think that's something uh, we're really, really poor, poor at. Um, the climate community has uh, uh, a, a culture of how it handles its data. It has its culture. The decision-making community has a, uh, that you might be working with has a different culture for how it handles data. We don't, part of our communication problem is because our data is not interoperable between them. So that, that going forward, that's, that's a big deal. How do you, uh, how do you, uh, you know, for, you know, the resilience officer for Miami-Dade County and they're worried about their sewer systems, how do they bring to bear these global climate stuff to tell them about their, when they have a whole different kind of data sets that they look at. That interoperability problem is, is something that people are working on, but just scratching the surface. I think you can imagine whole careers being based on developing that interoperability. So that's a big challenge. How do you think you can solve that plan? What one thing that I, I, I think we're, again, scratching the surface at is um, at the University of Miami uh, and other institutions in the area, we need to start partnering very, very carefully with, and the fact that, that Mayor Levine Cava is going to be here, I think, is an indicator. There's a, there's a will. We need, to, we need to cobble together the resources to be able to do this. But to start really working, and I'd love to see uh, academics that use postdocs embedded with the decision makers in Miami-Dade County to further their research, but also to do that research in a way that Miami-Dade can use it for its decision processes. So to me, the way, the real way forward is uh, really hard-nosed, detailed collaborations where we bring the academic community inside Miami-Dade. So we, we get a real nuts and bolts sense of what their challenges are, what their problems are, and we have embedded folks that are, you know, you can imagine someone doing their master's degree or their PhD, but they're embedded in Miami-Dade and then they bring that to campus, that experience, and, and make that part of their PhD. That's how I kind of envision that we can make big progress locally. But that's just a thought. Billy. Thanks, Ben. Great talk, of course. I couldn't agree more about your comments for co-designing with the stakeholders. So I'm thinking now uh, in terms of upscaling. So if we envision that we do and we have to do what you're saying on the hyper-local and we do it for different coastal cities that are different than environments, like Miami has a Gulf Stream, New Orleans has, a, you know, the Mississippi Delta and so on. How do you envision then what, is, what would be developed on the local scale to then feed back to the broader scale for the larger predictions so that they can benefit from that approach? Yeah, I think that gets back to the interoperability problem. Uh, and as we start to, I think we're on the ground floor of developing hyper-localized co-development processes, as you put it. So it's going to be very different in the Mississippi Delta than it would be here or Seattle, Washington, or, you know, at my father's house in Santa Barbara. It's always going to be very different. And uh, you, I just sort of have this vision that there's going to be this huge workforce development that is ordered to meet these hyper-localized 
uh, uh, demands local experts and part of the training of these local experts we need to you know almost like the civil engineering community has uh, standard practices for how to do things or architectural communities have standard practices we should have climate translators have standard practices and that involves making sure the data flows back up back up and so that's that's sort of what I you know 20 years from now I think this will all be oh yeah that's obvious we're going to share this part of the process I collect all this data doing this hyper local analysis and then I got to I got to share my results back to this uh, data repository that's available to a global community so that's what I I see as being we have to we have to think about how to do all of those things we have to be a little bit less ad hoc even though every time we do it it's going to be ad hoc so that's my guess. <laughs>